Hey everybody, I hope you guys are all doing okay. Welcome back to Let's Play Serlin Ultimate. And, uh, sorry, things are a bit quiet. I was, uh, wondering if the music had glitched out, but it looks like it was just taking a uh, few seconds before it looped back in, so everything's fine. All right. Welcome back to Let's Play Serlin Ultimate, where in this episode, it's going to be a, a bit of a special one. We're going to be doing, maybe for the first time since, like, the beginning, like, the very first episode, or, like, the first couple episodes, we're going to be doing a build guide for the character that we've been playing for pretty much the entire series. We're going to be doing a build guide for the animator. And uh, before we get going... Um, I'll, I mentioned this at the end of last episode, but I guess it is worth repeating. Why I've been waiting so long, uh, why, why it took me so long to uh, do this, given that it's episode 302 and we are very, very, very deep into this game. Um, one reason is because like, I'm always unsure of myself, especially in a game that's this complicated. I think it's hard to play this game and feel like you know it inside out. And usually when I do guides, like when I do guides for uh, games like, you know, Battle Cry 2 or for, you know, Might and Magic 6, Might and Magic 7, those are games where I'm like, okay, I understand these mechanics and if I'm telling you what I think is the best way to do something, I'm pretty confident that it actually is the best way. Whereas in this game, I do things and at no point, and even if the things that I'm doing are, are, you know, succeeding, you know, like technically they're getting the job done, at no point do I ever feel confident that I found the best way to do things. And so for a long time I had this idea in my head that, okay, I'll hold off doing a build guide until I somehow think I found an optimal or near optimal uh, arrangement, but at a certain point you've just got to accept the fact that this game is so complicated that it just isn't going to be possible to know if you're playing it optimally. Like, like this game is so complicated that I'm pretty sure we'll fucking solve the Riemann hypothesis, the, the Goldbach conjecture, the, the fucking... Uh, Colat's conjecture, or like all these, like P versus NP, like we'll solve all of those things before we come up with the optimal, you know, like the mathematically optimal way to play this game. So that's just a pipe dream, that's not going to happen. But in lieu of being technically optimal, the other thing is there are heuristics that you can use that'll give you a way to play that'll get the job done and that'll get the job done pretty quickly. And that, in the end, is what matters. N not is it optimal, but is it fun to play and is it able to do the important things in the game without too much issue. And the thing that we are able to accomplish with this build is that we are able to go very deep into this game I'm pretty sure Realm Depth 1275 qualifies as deep. We're just going down and down and down into these realms with uh, no sign of stopping. We are also able to take down false gods, not just false gods, but uh, uh, whenever we fight false gods, it's always on... Well, not only is it on uh, Instability 5, but then we go on and buff the god even more. You know, to get, give ourselves extra uh, chances to get loot out of that. And we even used uh, this build to fight a couple of the uh, Gate of the Gods uh, enemies. I, I know we used our uh, uh, animator build to take down Apocrinox and Tauren the very first and the very last gods that we fought. I think probably there would have been a couple uh, in between as well, that we uh, just, for the hell of it, 
took down with this build rather than a specialized god killing party. So, uh, so, um, I think it's time. It's just time to do a build guide. The way this is going to work is we're going to look one at a time at the different things that make a build in Cyrilim, because there are a few different components to it, and they all come together to give you uh, your build. But you start, of course, with your character class. Obviously, that's the first thing uh, you pick, and everything else kind of follows on from that. So what do we have? We have the animator. It doesn't look like the animator because we have, uh, you know, uh, we're using some uh, custom skin. I think was it the uh, one of the deprived skins, maybe. Anyway, let's look at the uh, the perks that we're using for our animator. Now, normally, I assume for most other specializations, you will want to unlock everything because most of these things are going to be uh, beneficial for you. But I am choosing not to do a few of these things just because I have a, a bit of a, a maybe an unorthodox animator build that is uh, a little bit different. So I'm not using Endowment, which is where the uh, Animators fuses with a copy of the second creature. I mean, there's no reason I couldn't use it. It's not that it's bad for me, it's just that it's uh, um, redundant. Because normally, I, I think the idea for a basic Animator party is that your Animator starts in position 1, and then it, you know, uh, fuses uh, with the second creature and splits damage with the sixth creature and uh, you know has some interaction with the third creature probably maybe like fifth creatures trait uh, fourth creatures five spell gems and 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 so on and like it you arrange your party based on the different uh, um, bonuses that you want your animators to get through its different uh, uh, party members. <coughs> Excuse me. This one is redundant because it all it does is it changes the race and I think maybe the class of the animators at the start of battle. But in my party, the Animatus isn't in position 1, it's in position 2. I'll talk about that later when I talk about the creatures in my party. But uh, for now, let's just look at uh, the rest of these perks. So I don't have this. I could have it, but it would be redundant. Not that uh, not spending the perk points is gaining me anything, but just because there's no reason to have that. The other thing is I'm not using animated gem. This one is very deliberate and I would probably have it this way even if my animatus was in position 1 because I don't want random spells firing off. Right? Because look at the description for animated gem. After uh, the animated gem's master manually casts a spell, this minion casts one of the master's uh, spells as well but chosen randomly. And that can sometimes cause unwanted things to happen. I want to be in full control of my spellcasting, so I'm not using this. The other thing I'm not using is Cogmind. This one, there's no reason not to take it, but I just... I have certain spells that I need, and then I don't need any more beyond that, and I don't want to clutter my Animatus' uh, spell list. Because there are already, like, tons of ethereal spell gems that I'm... Uh, um, I'm having to look through, I don't want like even more, like my spell list is fine as it is. So these are the three things that I'm not using. Everything else has been maxed out. Some of these are things that you just put one point into and then you just unlock them, but some of them, like uh, this one, you've got multiple ranks, you gotta max it out. Like this one has 50 ranks, you gotta max that out. This one also has 50 ranks, that one has 5 ranks. 
pretty everything other than Cogline, Dark Anima, Endowment, all maxed out. That is our specialization. Now, let's look at our creatures. So we have a Rift Dancer. Oh, and by the way, I should mention that I'm also going to be in the description having a link to uh, the Cyrilim Build Planner website with a link to this specific build. Uh, so it's easy for you to follow what I'm talking about because there's a lot of a lot of individual parts in this. Yeah, we have Rift Dancer in position 1. We have the Animatus, as I mentioned, in position 2. The Ebony Ant in uh, position 3. Maraxis, our avatar creature in position 4. Mimic, another very important creature in position 5. And the Dread White in position 6. Out of... Like, all of these creatures are important, all of these creatures have their own role, but the most important creatures are, first, the Animatus, because everything about the Animator party depends on the Animatus. The Animatus is our damage dealer, and the creature that we would expect to survive if uh, things got rough. We have the Mimic, the second most important creature, because the Mimic, number one, starts at the top the top of the timeline. And specifically, the Mimic in position five. W because of one of the animator perks, will give its trait to the animators at the start of combat. Meaning both the Mimic and the animators are always going to be at the top of the timeline. Unless there's some funny stuff happening, like that barred creature that shuffles the timeline, or if you're fighting agile uh, nemesis uh, creatures. So, but barring those two situations, we should always be at the top of the timeline, which means most trash mob battles, we can just end in one turn without them doing any nonsense. The third most important creature is Maraxis who is our avatar creature, and Maraxis's main trait, I guess I should be showing these traits, um, Maraxis's main traits, um, a main trait, is that th there's no longer diminishing returns in battle. And it just means that if, for example, you run into a situation, especially in boss fights, where enemies are uh, like too tanky for you to take down easily with your regular attacks. You don't have to just sit there and like sp spend an hour chipping them down. You can just buff yourself and you can keep buffing, especially using Clayman, you can keep doubling and growing exponentially until you're strong enough to take them down. If you were to do that while being held back by diminishing returns, it would be a lot more annoying. And other than that, we have the Rift Dancer in uh, uh, position 1. We have a lot of uh, effects uh, that happen on death. Uh, those happen extra times. We have the uh, Ebony Ent on position 3, where uh, we have Mending, we take less damage. That's just a nice thing to have. We have the Dread White in uh, position 6. The Dread White is the tank of the party who will uh, usually be provoking and getting all damage going his way and usually w will be like impervious to damage but on the off chance that enemies somehow manage to kill him he has a 50% chance to resurrect with full health. But of course our creatures have more than one trait. And when you play this game for a while, you tend to start looking at your creatures as a collection of traits more than anything else. Yes, their initial uh, race is important because uh, that'll determine uh, you know, so some stuff about their stats and their the fusion will determine their class. And um, regardless of the fusion, their race will always be the same. There are things that do, de you know, change depending on 
what race your, your creature has, but this isn't the kind of build that really depends on you having all the same race. For example, there are other uh, builds, uh, especially uh, like Diabolic Horde builds, where uh, you know the the specific kind of creature you have is actually very important. But for our purposes, really. It's less so the creatures and more so the collection of traits that you have through the creature's base trait, the extra trait you get through its uh, fusions, and uh, the extra trait you get through the artifact. And then, if you're really lucky, you might find some useful traits on nether stones, so you can have those as well. So let's look through this, and all of these traits are valuable. Some are more important than others. So trait number two on the Rift Dancer, Magic Barrier, very important. If your creatures have cast a total of 12 or more spells, they become immune to debuffs. Um, I think maybe in boss battles it's a bit different and it just makes you resistant instead of immune. I'm not sure about that. But regardless, it's good to have in situations where debuffs are annoying because it can render them into a non-issue it's, it's good to have not crucial but I do enjoy having this trade it's uh, more for convenience than anything else trait number three is goad and this trait this trait specifically is why I have my animators in position two and not position one because what Goad does is cre ad adjacent creatures, not the creature itself, but adjacent creatures attack two additional times. Now, I have my, you might be wondering, hey, if all you want is your animators to have uh, two uh, addi additional attacks, you could have them in position one, you have the Rift Dancer in position two, that would work, but I'm also reserving the right, like, if I'm... If I feel like it, I'm reserving the right to also replace one of the Ebony Ents traits with Goad as well. So right now, his, uh, or its, uh, ar artifact trait is Big Brained. Let's say I'm having a really annoying, like, specific boss fight, and I'm like, this fight would be so much easier if I had five attacks instead of three, and, uh, I have the uh, the chance of doing that, and then the Ebony Ants bonus, uh, gold bonus would stack with the Rift Dancers one as well. And also, trait 2 on the Ebony Ant is uh, anytime an ally attacks, creatures recover health. Given that we'll be doing massive attacks, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good uh, way to get our health back. And then trait 3. This is very important. Creatures are immune to confused. Confusion is just not a fun thing to deal with. It, it just isn't great when you're trying to do something and then it just backfires. So just better to just not have to deal with it at all. Next, we'll talk about Meraxis. We already talked about the, the base trait. Pretty, pretty important. But let's look at what else Meraxxus has. We have this. After the creature attacks, it afflicts the target with blind and confused. Uh, I mean, it, it's... I've, mm, I, I, I could take it or leave it at this point, but it is nice being able to put confusion on enemies, especially on bosses, and then having some of their stuff just backfire on them. But in a pinch, I mean, I could maybe see myself getting rid of this for another thing, although that would entail getting a new Meraxis and then fusing it with some, something else, because trait number two is our fusion trait. Trait number three, our artifact trait. After creatures die, this creature gains uh, their stats. Again... Like, I used to like it a lot more because we used to have more of a, um, like, a strategy of actually killing and reincarnating our own creatures. 
specifically our Dread White. I haven't been doing that as often anymore, so I could actually just get rid of Dark Embrace and not really even notice that much of a difference. I might do that if I think of some really crucial trait that I think I need and that would improve things. But I'll keep this for now because sometimes, every once in a while, enemies will manage to kill our creatures. Just like by one-shotting us, there might be some boss trait or something. So it's nice to have this as a fallback, you know, like we'll have this one creature that's kind of just scooping up their stats. And then we have this trait from uh, a nether stone. After this creature attacks, it steals attack and intelligence and gives it to your creatures. Again, <sighs> nice to have, um, but not really that... Like, it's not make or break. I don't think there's any battle that it's like, oh no, we would have lost if it wasn't for uh, a Miraxis <laughs> stealing 20% of their intelligence. But yeah, it's a, it's a thing. It's fine. It's okay. And then we look at uh, the Mimic. Obviously, the most important trait is this uh, base trait. But the others are pretty nice as well. After an enemy is resurrected, it has a chance to be killed again. And this is one of several options at our disposal for stopping or shutting down enemy resurrections because it's really annoying when you kill something and it just comes back. This is one option. I hate resurrection I hate resurrections so much that we also even have a second way to shut down resurrections built into our build. But that'll depend on our anointments, which I haven't showed you yet, because we haven't gotten to that part of the build. Like I, I told you, this is a complicated game. But yeah, this is a uh, what we're using. And this one is very important. This was a late addition to our uh, uh, build. I, I think maybe even... Well, Definitely post episode 200. At, like at, at some point, I was like, I was getting really annoyed at enemies that would uh, have scripted spells that would be cast at the start of combat. Mainly because it would just waste my try time. I'm like, like I don't. I'm a busy man. I don't have time to sit through your nonsense because you're all gonna die anyway. So all you're doing is. Just adding seconds to the fight while I wait to take my one turn <laughs> that it's going to take to kill you all. So this will silence enemies for one turn at the start of combat. One turn is all it takes to shut down all of that start of battle garbage. A lot of the annoying garbage <laughs> that your enemies will do to you in this game. There are a lot of enemies that will do a lot of annoying garbage to you. But disproportionately a lot of it will be stuff that's happening at the start of combat so if you have some like so this one turn is all that it'll take to shut down any spell casting related mischief that they would have otherwise gotten up to that is trait number three now we also have a couple different traits from uh, our nether stone after creatures are resurrected three enemies are afflicted with stone that's neither here nor there, but the next trait, your creatures have um, more attack, intelligence, defense, and speed for each turn they've taken in battle. So that's again just a, a few more stats. The extra defense is nice to have, you know, it's nice to have. Finally we have the uh, um, uh, Dread White. The base trait means if my enemy does kill it, even if we don't have the uh, rebirth buff on it, it's gonna have a chance to come back. Then we have Woe. This creature, it's very easy to stack a lot of max health on it, um, thanks to the relic it's using. And again, we haven't gone to relics yet, because that's a whole other part of the build. Like I said, this game is complicated. 
uh, long story short, um, the Dread White and the Animatus are two creatures that will have a very easy chance stacking large amounts of maximum health. And then this creature with its large uh, stockpile of maximum health is a potential, uh, you know, like a bomb waiting to, to go off for the enemy. Like, even if they do kill it, all that's going to happen to them is they're going to take a, a, a absolute truckload of damage. Again, this is something that I used more earlier on when I specifically, specifically had this strategy of killing and reincarnating the Dread White. I don't use it that often anymore, but every so often it is useful to have this specifically as an option to do damage. It's a... Uh, uh, yeah, it's something that I'll keep even if I would prefer not to use it in most situations. And then the... This one is pretty important. After this creature is resurrected, your other creatures are resurrected as well. Combined with the fact that it has a chance of resurrecting just by itself, and if it doesn't resurrect by itself, somebody else can always resurrect it. Um, that means it's going to be very hard for enemies to permanently keep our party members down, even if they are able to kill them, which is a, a rare, uh, you know, unusual occurrence these days. And then we have a, uh, um, a trait that we're getting through our uh, Netherstone, a Barbarian, which is actually pretty important. After start of battle effects, this creature provokes. This means at the start of battle, like, I guess this is the very final thing that'll happen before the start of battle, is that this creature will provoke, meaning this tanky creature with high defense and the ability to stack a lot of maximum health is going to start battles already provoking which means any enemy that tries to attack uh, one of our other creatures is going to be re redirected to uh, um, it instead. Very uh, important defensive part of our party. So when I said, you know, um, or, you know like, when I was giving the order of, of importance, I was like, ooh, Animatus, then Mimic, then Miraxis. That was in terms of attacking the enemy, but in terms of defense, this is probably our more, uh, most important defensive creature. And I could show you specifically the artifacts. Um, ultimately, it doesn't really matter that much. Because what artifacts do is... The main thing about different artifact types is that based on uh, the artifact... Uh, based on what type it is, uh, it gives a chance for you, for you to cast spells for free on certain triggers. So for instance, Boots means you have a chance of casting something on turn, so our uh, uh, Rift Dancer has a chance of casting Entangling Roots on turn. You also have Boots, so you have a chance of casting Archangel's Blessing on turn. You have a sword, which means you have a chance of casting Archangel's Blessing on attack. You have a sword, which means you have a, a chance of casting Star Pact on attack. And, uh... Um... I, I think you have a chance of casting Archangel's Blessing on cast. Like, if you're already casting something, then you can cast more things. And I think Helmet is, I think, either on defense or on provoke. Ooh, one thing I, I, th I think I might have not shown you, the uh, other traits on my animators. This is actually pretty important. Um, I, I should have shown them to you when I was uh, talking about traits, but I just, I just comple I completely skipped over the traits of the most important creature. Because oh, I, I was talking about the Animatus' order in the party, and I spent so much time talking about the Animatus that I just moved on uh, and without talking about this one thing, but this is important, right? 
So this is the, ba the base trait for the Animators. Pretty nice. It, it has a way of gaining stats. And gaining stats if its uh, teammates start dying. Note that it's not that it gains stats when creatures di die, but while creatures are dead, it gains attack and intelligence. While creatures are alive, it has defense and speed, so it's important you understand exactly how it works. The Animatus does also gain things on creature death, like, like a one-time gain on death, and then if the creature dies again, you gain it again. But this one is just number of dead creatures, number of living creatures. So that's the base trait. And then the artifact trait, Consecrated, Gr Consecrated Ground, is another major reason why I have the Animatus uh, in the middle and not uh, here or here because well I guess I could have swapped things around I could have I could have the an animators here I could have the Rift Dancer here and th then the Rift Dancer could have uh, consecrated ground but I'm like I could have the animators do this like be the one with the consecrated ground meaning adjacent allies one additional adjacent ally if I'm not right at the end, plus I give myself the option of having uh, multiple uh, goad bonuses, even though right now I only have one. So that's the trait number two. And then this uh, trait is if I attack one enemy, and if I do more than a certain threshold of damage, all enemies take that damage, or 70% of that damage, and usually this means I'm killing the entire party in one go. That is a that is kind of crucial. Um, I think next I'll just show you uh, the spells, and I'll just go through these in order. So mutagen is my resurrection spell. Reincarnation is a spell that kills and then brings back to life one of your creatures. So it's something that I have in my back pocket to use on the Dread White as a way of triggering that uh, uh, damage where it does a percentage of its max health to the enemy uh, as damage if it gets killed. So I have that as an option. I also have Greater Dispel, a very important spell. Rabbit Dementia I have as a uh, way to get my animators to attack even when it is not its turn. So I cast Rabbit Dementia on my Animatus, regardless of whose turn is it, and then he'll do his attacks. Life Orb, eh, I, I don't think I've ever used it, but it's it's nice to have as a, as a backup. Clayman, one of the most important spells. This is the uh, spell. I guess I should be um, showing the spell text as well because maybe not everybody has all of these spells memorized so reincarnation target is killed and resurrected mutagen target is resurrected and even gains a stats so uh, so that's nice greater dispel our debuffs and enemies buffs are removed one of the most powerful broken spells in the game and I'm terrified that they're gonna nerf this in the upcoming patch. I really hope they don't. I I love this spell. And by the way, enemies can use it on you as well. So that's the other the other thing. If enemies have this spell, they can also in one fell swoop get rid of all their debuffs and all of your buffs. So I, I really hope uh, nothing happens to the spell. Rabbit Dementia, you cast it on a target and then that target attacks a random enemy for 200% normal damage. The thing about this is that this is also a way to evade or a, a way to get around enemy invisibility because if enemies are invisible you can't directly target them with uh, attacks but this forces you, uh, uh, the person that it's cast on to attack an enemy and then it can even when choosing a random target even hit enemies that are invisible, which is nice. And life orb, dead creatures are resurrected and uh, healed. And clayman, target gains maximum health equal to its current health, which 
Assuming you can heal your health back every turn means you can double your health every turn. And uh, more than double because we have other bonuses to our stat gains, which is uh, pretty nice. And then we have some other spells. Star Pact is one of our damaging spells. Contagion, uh, we have as a way of removing enemy uh, minions. Blank Slate to remove enemy... Uh, like extra traits, uh, clay man again, um, mutagen again, defile, uh, blight. Uh, it blights enemies. Blight is a pretty important status effect. It's nice to have. Dispel again. Finger of death is another option in terms of damaging spells. Entangling roots, very important spell. Enemies are snared, which can basically stun lock an entire enemy party and keep them from going and then you can just you can essentially keep taking your turns forever as long as you can keep casting uh, Entangling Roots. Archangel's Blessing, your enemies recover percentage health which is pretty important because uh, any spell that heals a fixed amount of health even if you have it buffed, you know, with, you know, stronger healing, eventually if you're scaling your health with Clayman, you'll get to a point where it's not going to do that much healing as a percentage of health. But this heals just straight up the proportion of health uh, that it says. And so with just a few of these, you can heal all the way back to full health. And then you can cast Clayman again. Um, and... Yeah. You rinse and repeat. Got this spell again. You've got polish, um, which is a way of getting spell charges back. Although again, I rarely use it. Um, so that's uh, your spells. Do you have any new spells? You've got mutilate, which means enemies take damage equal to 50% of the target's current health, which is another way of uh, dealing damage because all. <coughs> Excuse me, because all of our creatures are going to be gaining uh, maximum health. And then we've got Time Walk, which is a, a way of forcing, you know, enemy... It's a way of manip manipulating enemy turn counters. And uh, it's situationally useful. It's a nice one to have. Now we look at the, uh, the Mimic. Astral Dimension, very important spell. Uh, any time enemies do funny business trying to seal your spell gems you can cast this spell this spell itself cannot be sealed so you will always have the option to cast it we got wormhole um, which like if I really want to give a specific party member an extra turn I can always cast wormhole exhaustion again situationally useful um, although I haven't used it in a while and then finally, um, the Dread White. You've got Misery, which just puts a whole lot of bad debuffs on one target. Then we got a Impending Doom, which has a chance to insta-kill. Again, situationally it's useful, like if there's a really annoying enemy that's evading my normal uh, mechanisms for killing it. I can just like try and brute force it by trying killing it with impending doom, which is a random chance of uh, killing it. A random chance that gets higher the longer the battle goes. Feign death is nice because with my dread white I can activate the things that would happen on death, like the woe damage um, and the stat gains for my animators, you know, which gains stats when our creatures die, but without actually killing my Dread White at all, which is important because you have a limited number of resurrections in uh, this game, I think 10 uh, per battle, beyond which your creatures just will not be able to be resurrected anymore. That's pretty uh, important to have this. Um, and then we have... Uh, Fire Devil's Rage, which is very important. It afflicts all enemies with burning. And it, the reason I have it is because it plays into 
our second mechanism for shutting down enemy resurrections. Which I'll talk about when I talk about uh, uh, anointments, which I'm going to talk about, I think, uh, right now. Like, uh, right now when I'm done with spells. But, like, we have this spell. Just wanted to draw attention, attention, attention to that. And we have one more rabbit dimension. Yeah, let me just get a sip of water because I have been talking. I have been talking a lot. I've been talking for, in fact, 40 minutes. Wow. 40 minutes. And I'm still not even done explaining the build. Man, this is insane. Um, okay. But we've got to do this. We've got to do this, all right? So before I um, uh, leave the subject of spells, I should mention that if you're playing the game, especially if you're not as deep into the end game, you might be looking at some of these spells and you might be like, hey, where'd you get that? Like, where'd you get, you know, Clayman? Or like, where'd you get, uh, you know, Wormhole or like Time Walk or... Uh, like, so some of these spells aren't there by default in uh, the, uh, you know, normal list of spells. Some of the spells you have to unlock by either buying them from gods and, ha like, and having enough favor with the gods to unlock them and, and then buying them from those gods. Or buying them from guilds and again you're gonna need to have a high enough uh, reputation with the guilds to unlock uh, the different things that, that they're selling. I'll leave a link in the description along with the link to my build. I'll leave a link to uh, the um, like the unofficial Sirlim database, where among other things, like you, you can look up traits, creatures, and spells. And when you look up the spells. If there's a special thing you have to do to find that spell, like, you know, it'll say, oh, it's in the Miraxis God Shop, or, oh, it's a, uh, it's a Life Guild spell, then you'll know where to find it. And if it says, oh, you know, it's a Life Guild spell, and you go to Life Guild and it's not there, then you'll know you have to get more uh, reputation, more ranks with, uh, you know, that guild in, or in order to unlock that spell. Same with if it says, "Ooh, this is in the uh, in the in the in the Tartareth God Shop," and you go there and it's not there. Well, then that means you just need more uh, rank with that God. And, and now that you know what you need, you can uh, focus on getting it uh, that way. So the next part of our build is uh, anointments. So, these are the five that we're using. Burn Their Corpses, Dreadnought, Onslaught, Shimmer, Singleton. They're all very important. Um, so, Shimmer is very crucial. Your creatures take 5% less damage for each ethereal spell gem, up to 90% reduced damage. And we have a ton of ethereal spell gems. Because uh, each time we have a uh, spell that is uh, that says generous, and almost all of our spells are going to be generous. Some of them won't, but most of them will be. That means it's adding an ethereal spell gem to our creatures' pools, and we have w way more than eighteen of them. Um, And the gist of it is, we are always gonna, gonna have that 90% damage reduction. So that's one anointment. Next one is Dreadnought from Hell Knight. Creatures' attacks cannot be dodged. This is more of a convenience thing, because every once in a while, like especially for false gods, you might be in a situation where the false god is immune to spells and immune to indirect damage and so you can only damage it by attacking it it's really annoying when your attacks get dodged so 
it's this one just saves us a lot of time. It's nice to have. Let's look at the Reaver Anointment Onslaught. This is just a a dual bonus giving you percentage damage reduction and also a percentage damage bonus. So a bit of both. Eh, just a nice one. This one I could maybe drop in favor of something else. But you know what? I think it's better to just keep it. And then we have Singleton. Very important anointment. And Mies can only attack and cast spells one at a time. Because frequently... Let's look through... Uh... So, it's not showing up in... Uh... in these, so it's probably in the hidden realm properties, um, but there are realm properties that says, oh, enemies attack seven extra times, enemies cast nine extra times, and if you don't have singleton, they will waste so much of your time just going through their dumb little animations, and uh, singleton helps you avoid all of that. There's one anointment I haven't gone over yet. That is burn their corpses. If any enemy dies while it's afflicted with burning, it cannot be resurrected. This won't work against false gods. It would be so nice if it worked against Caliban, but it doesn't. But it'll work against everything else. And so if there is a... Uh, It, it doesn't look like we're going to have that in the upcoming uh, realm. But if we had a realm where enemies all had rebirth, or enemies all had uh, just as a realm property resurrect on death, this would stop them from resurrecting. And this is why we also have a um, Fire Devil's Rage on uh, on you, because it's it's a way to inflict burning on all enemies and then you you inflict burning and then the idea is that the very next turn you kill all of them in one go and then they don't resurrect and then they're they're just they're just gone they're just gone um, the one final thing I have to go over is the the relics so um, I have Bloodseeker equipped on uh, my animatus. This relic is important because it's a way of gaining maximum health and not only that but other creatures also gain maximum health when you gain maximum health. Right, so it's a very very important and also it means damage is now based on maximum health rather than uh, whatever other stat it would have been. You have, you have potency of bearer spells and I think attacks as well. Maybe not attacks, but the spells are going to be uh, uh, boosted by having a high max health. So that's one. I also have uh, a few others. I have... Uh, the other important relic is this one on the Dread White. This is a very powerful defensive relic. Um, <coughs> so each time this relic attacks, the bearer gains defense. The bearer gains more defense and maximum health. The bearer takes less indirect damage. After this relic attacks, the bearer gains maximum health. And at the end of each enemy's turn, uh, the bearer takes less damage from attacks and spells. After the bearer gains maximum health, it recovers health. And it has a chance to avoid damage. Minus 10% for, e for each time. The, the uh, effect has activated. It's just a... It's just a great way to make an already tanky creature just even harder 
to do any real damage to. The other two uh, that we have, um, we have uh, uh, Vitreus and I'm trying to find it. Uh, where is it? Vitreus, was it Whisper or Rib? No, it was Ribcracker, right? Yeah. Vitreus and Ribcracker. So, and what makes both of these good is both of them have a thing. So, this one does it at rank 70. If you cast five spells, then spells don't consume charges anymore. That's very important. And uh, Vitreus also does something similar at rank 70. So it means that those two creatures will uh, just have infinite uh, spell casting. Importantly, you'll note that two of my creatures just don't have relics equipped at all. So my Rift Dancer and my Mimic don't have relics equipped on them at all. That's because none of the relics that I've seen have been really that useful. I guess I could just equip um, Ribcracker or Vitreus on them as well, but then that'll make turns go faster because they'll be uh, like attacking, like or like the the relic will be attacking at the start of every turn. And so, in the interest of making battles quicker, I don't even have relics on two of my creatures, right? Because I'm depending on the other parts of my build to carry me. So I think we've gone over everything. We went over our uh, perks. We went over our creatures, our traits, our spells. We went, we went over our anointments. And then finally we went over our relics. And now, 52 minutes. 52 minutes into this episode. We are finally g gonna like be able to prove to you that it's not just talk, it's not just, you know, that this build is good on paper, this build is actually good in practice, and I'll show you that by going into this realm <coughs> and taking down a nether boss. We're gonna take down King Ramses. We're gonna do it on Realm Instability 5, which is the, the highest, and we're gonna have a good time. It's, uh, and uh, we're gonna... Well, we're just gonna we're just gonna have a good time. We're gonna do this in uh, in the arachnid nest. Yeah, haven't been there in a while. Well, I've been away from the game for a while, but uh, this is usually where I do my boss fights. All right, Make our donation. What do we have? We have about eight enemies, a master as well. All right. Well, these jokers started with five buffs, so that's annoying, because some of them resurrected because they had rebirth, but it's okay, it's fine. It's fine, well, let me also check something. 1278. I was hoping that the next realm would be our false god fight. Because that would be the uh, the true, uh, or or like one true uh, uh, what's what's the a, a demonstration one a true demonstration of how good our build is. Although like we fought plenty of false gods, if you. If you're skeptical as to whether this build can take down false gods, just go to any of the uh, any of the previous episodes or any of the upcoming episodes, because we're going to be fighting lots and lots of false gods. Oh, I also need to. to switch out my macros a little bit. So. Uh... I guess while we're at it, I'll show you my macros. 
So I've got macros for lots of different things, but the, mo the most important ones are uh, this one. This I'll use if there's really annoying resurrection synergies. It's Fire Devil's Rage and Rabbit Dementia, that's what FDR and RD stand for. This is the one I'm using right now, but we don't need it right now because enemies don't have any resurrections. So in its place, I can just have regular Rabbit Dementia. If regular Rabbit Dementia isn't cutting it, and if I don't have to worry about enemy resurrections, I can do this instead, which is Clayman and Rabbit Dementia, which means first I cast Clayman, then I attack with Rabbit Dementia. And that'll... Like, if I'm not killing the enemy in one hit, then one cast of Clayman is usually going to be able to... Uh, get the job done. So let me summon a few of these just for fun. Because we are farming cards as well. And these creatures are dying because of a realm property. I'm not even doing anything. This time I did do something. And... <laughs> Just murdered them with extreme prejudice. I think we might we might have time. You know what? We'll do two rounds. We'll do we'll we'll see. We'll see how long this round takes. And if it's not too late, we'll do one more round. Just cause I don't want people to think that oh, he just he probably just got lucky. And you're like, he probably got an easy realm. And, and, and that's why he's having such an easy time. Although, like, if, if you think that again, just see any of the uh, previous episodes or the upcoming episodes, and that'll give you a much better sample size for uh, the kinds of uh, different scenarios that this build has operated in. Hey, what's that? Toxic Frog Mania on attack. What does that spell do again? Okay. So it's a poison based spell. Not really that interesting for us, but yeah, maybe if you have a poison based build, yeah, could be it could be a good thing. So far we're doing pretty good. We have a master to fight as well. And of course the nether boss. And other than that we're just chilling. Well there is the, the, the nether boss. I think there's no reason not to just... Not to just go after him right now. Let's do it. Hey, Ramses. King Ramses. Alright, um. That's a reference to Karch, the Cowardly Dog, by the way. One of the best episodes of. The, like, no, not even one. It, like, by far the best episode of that show is the. The, the King Ramses uh, one. And. 90% of why that's the best episode is because of the song. <laughs> the, uh, the King Ramses. The man and goes. The man and goes. Alright, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop singing because uh, in addition <laughs> to not being someone who can sing, it's also <laughs> distracting me. What am I... What am, I, what am I even trying to do? I should look up what your thing is. Enemies always have cursed. Okay, so I was, I was gonna try and dispel it. I'm, gl I'm glad I read this description so I'm not wasting my dispels 
trying to take, or like wasting my turns trying to dispel something that isn't even gonna go away anyway. At the start of each enemy's turn, they attack three of their allies. I, I don't fucking care, man. Nobody cares. Nobody likes you, dude. Just do... Oh god, come on, man. Gems sealed after casting. Is that it? Oh, fuck, man. <sighs> okay. Um, let me... Cast Mutagen on you. Uh, let me cast Rabid Dementia on you. <coughs> this should finish these guys off. Wait, what the Excuse me, what? I mean, that was weird. I'm not sure what was going on with his health. Recovered... He kept recovering health because of Curse of the Barons? Is that his trait or some other fused trait that he has? Regardless, we took him down and in spite of the uh, the the weirdness that was happening at the Oh, they're fused with bards, which is shuffling the timeline. Ah, oh, that fucking sucks. Yeah, that's really annoying. But we don't have to worry about it too much. I mean, we're basically done with the realm. We just need to find the master. Kill the rest of these guys that we summoned. And, uh, and, and, we're, and then we're good. And then we're good. Got a few of these uh, nemesis creatures to take down. just that one part of the map left. Well, some few more of these. I gotta go... Uh, uh, see, I'll, I'll show you when I take my turn. What's happened is they have this fusion in their party. Him of Panic at the start of battle, the timeline is shuffled randomly. It's, it's annoying because it means a key part of our build, which is the uh, the mimic, which is supposed to put us at the top of the timeline, is being completely nullified. But they own, they have a random chance. They won't always have such a creature in their party. At this time, they ha they do have a creature that's doing that, as evidenced by the fact that our timeline is shuffled again. But it won't always happen, and even when it does happen, it, it usually doesn't. Like, it's an inconvenience, but... They shuffle the timeline, but then everyone's gonna take their turns anyway. All you're doing is maybe delaying your own defeat by just a couple of turns. Alright. Alright. 
how are we for time? Definitely past an hour at this point. Yeah, an hour and four minutes. We'll do one more realm. Because I feel like in an episode where I'm purporting to show you that I have a build that's going to work really well for you, I really should show you more evidence that it does work, more evidence than just one realm. But I think we're going to have to call it after the second realm, because that's a... Uh, because uh, otherwise that's going to be a bit too long of an episode. And then we have uh, this dude, let's quickly take you down. The Arachnalisk Master, right? They have shuffled the timeline. Fucking sucks. Um, do this. Do uh, this. Do uh, this. And I think we can just try and win. Easy. Get some, uh, some more loot out of these last nemesis creatures. And then we can turn around and uh, head on to the next realm. Alright. Yeah, sure, I'll, I guess we'll see if there's any. There's almost never anything in, in these. At, at, at tunnels. Unless they end in dead ends or lead to big rooms. Occasionally, I guess you'll find materials. Usually, there isn't anything, you know, too interesting. Yeah. Kill one more of these guys. I see they shuffle the timeline again. I'll kill one more of them. I'm not super motivated to hunt down every single... I like to go into these tunnels. I, d I don't really care about what may or may not be in that corridor there. I think we're just gonna go to the next realm. I'm gonna do one more realm. Let's go to new realm. I'm gonna roll myself a nice bonus, 391. Feels pretty nice. We'll do a random realm. And hopefully the game throws a bigger challenge towards us. You know, something in the uh, realm properties maybe. Yeah, okay. Attacking 11 times. This is one of the key, key reasons that we have Singleton as an anointment. Because if we didn't have that, every single time enemies would attack, if they ever got the chance to attack, they would just make our lives very, very miserable. What's going on with the enemy health? What's going on with the enemy health? That was, that was weird. It was probably something to do with their... with their traits. Like they are probably gaining health. Even though it looked like they were losing it. Yeah, gained max health in favor of survival. Because enemies seem to be a bit more durable than they were in the last round, what I'll do is I'll switch my macro for my animators and my mimic to be Clayman and Rabbit Dementia. Just 
spending one turn giving us a boost and then the next turn we'll be able to kill them more quickly. I think this is going to be an effective way of dealing with this realm. Let's go, let's go. Oh, well, this is a <laughs> fucking waste of time. <laughs> Awful realm generation, at least in that part of the map. Alright. Hey, more nether stones. Alright, let's, let's test it. Test it out. The macro change. Oh, these specters. They attack you when you cast spells. Which is annoying. Right. I think this is working out pretty nicely. What These guys are annoying because they, along with the uh, the bard, are the other type of creature that can mess with our uh, strategy of always having our people at the top of the timeline because they instead will put themselves on the top of the timeline and It'll just be uh, annoying. Well, let's take down this person who is probably the master. The Spectre Master. What do you have to say? Spectres excel at crippling their opponents to make for an easy kill. Their kids are really great too. Well, I mean, those babies probably aren't really their own kids, but you know, what the fuck? What are you talking? What is this man? What is this man talking about? Oh, it. I literally, I've, I literally just noticed they're holding, they're holding babies. Wow. You know how sometimes you look at an image and you kind of, your brain kind of just processes it as a like generic fantasy image without noticing the details. I, I literally never noticed that these guys are carrying children. What is going on? What is that guy doing? Like, he's complicit in fucking <laughs> child trafficking? What is going on in this game? What is this madness? Hold up. There's one person down. Not quite enough to take the rest of them down, but... I don't think these guys are going to last too long. Yeah, that's what you get. That's what you get for kidnapping those children, if, if that's what you did. Yeah, I mean, unless there's some weird, like, interspecies <laughs> adoption program. Which is the only other explanation for how they could have gotten those kids. Anyway, let's not think about that too much. Oh, that white is probably going to be resurrecting, right? Oh no, the white is going to resurrect the rest of his team. Alright, let's, uh, let's summon a few more uh, Korok's Apocalypses. Just because uh, just because this is a build guide slash build demonstration episode doesn't mean we shouldn't also be trying to do other important game objectives such as uh, farming for cards. What else is there to do in this room? Nothing really, because this isn't a boss realm. We've already killed the master. Oh, we gotta, obviously, 
do the realm objective. But beyond that, I think we're good to go. You know what? You know what would have been perfect as a way to demonstrate this build is if Xantai showed up in this realm. Well, he has a very small chance of showing up, so I don't think... Uh, I don't think... We're gonna have a high chance of encountering him. Because he is a special boss encounter that you unlock, you know, when you're deep into the end game. He's basically, when you fight him, he has three random... He's basically like three random nether bosses fused into one. And fights with them can get very chaotic and potentially difficult if you don't have a strong build. Alright, so I'm not going to make the same mistake. I'm going to cast Fire Devil's Rage. This is going to prevent them from resurrecting. And there we go. Handled. Alright, how are we for time? We are at 1 hour 16, and we're pretty close to finishing this realm, so I think... I think we're, uh, we're doing okay. Around an hour uh, and 20, I think, is very decent, given the fact that there was so much to talk about with uh, this... Uh, this build guide but you know we got through it and hopefully watching us obliterate these enemies is giving you a sense of you know that this build actually does what I'm telling you it does meaning it takes down trash mobs very easily and it is robust it's hard to kill can take down bosses pretty quickly as well by scaling infinitely thanks to uh, Miraxis. And it's got different ways of doing damage as well, which uh, helps you a lot when you're uh, fighting false gods as well, because they will often restrict the damage types that you can use against the boss. Let's, uh, let's finish this. Finish these guys. Didn't find any cards this episode. That's mainly because we've only done two realms. We did find a couple nether stones that we're probably just gonna grind up into piety. Right, where's the exit? There's the exit. Oh, but there's a... But there's a lot in this realm that we haven't seen. Is the candle close by? Can we summon some more friends? I think we can, and I, th I think we should. Probably won't kill every single one of them, but we'll, uh, we'll go through a decent chunk. Obviously, the more of these we kill, the higher our chances of uh, finding the card. Alright, alright. that talk to you and think after we finish this realm quest we'll just head home after a job well done 
No sign of Xantai, unfortunately, but... You'll just have to take my word for it, even if Xantai did show up. We'd probably take him down pretty easily. He would have to get really lucky with some really awful combination of boss traits in order to really threaten us. But I don't think uh, I don't think we gotta gotta, gotta wor worry about that too much. I mean, we don't have to worry about it at all because he just hasn't showed up at all in this realm. But I meant, you know, long term for our future encounters with him in the series. All right. Alright. Now we're done? There's seven enemies left. We're probably gonna leave most of them. I mean, I'll kill this guy. Because he's in the way. But we'll leave the rest of them and we'll probably just head home. Or should we kill the rest of them because it's the uh, it's the final realm? Where even are they? Okay, they're they're all in the same area, so I think I'll I'll go around. I'll I'll, I'll kill them. It'll be it'll be fine. It'll give us a s small chance of finding the card. Come on, it's a... Well... Could... I mean... That's just... That's just so... Wonderful. It wasn't on the very final enemy, there were three of them left, but it was so close. And I went out of my way to kill them, and it feels so vindicating when you're like, oh, you know, when I, you know, like when I was thinking, oh, you know, we could end the realm, but I was like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kill the last few because it's a small chance of getting the card, and then you actually get the card. That was a, uh, that felt, that felt pretty. Pretty great. And now we, I think, are one card away from finishing the Apocalypse set. Let me just confirm that. Oh. Yeah, one more card will finish this set. And then enemies with Scorn are just gonna have a bad time. Right, so we're done. Let's head back home. Hand in this project and uh, call an end to this episode. And then project, how are we for for like forage missions? We need to do hold on, we need to do three more forage missions and one uh, and, and four more experiments. So also another forage. Okay. With that done. Let's reflect on what we accomplished in this episode. We spent nearly an hour going through our build, talking through it. We talked about the uh, the creatures, we talked about the, uh, the spells, we talked about the anointments, we talked about the relics, uh, we talked about the, the traits, obviously. There was a lot to talk about, and it was all very complicated, and you might be intimidated at all of this and if you are feeling that um, I will reiterate something that I said at the very start of this episode which is that I myself when I was thinking about putting together a build guide was completely racked with imposter syndrome I'm like oh I don't know enough about this game the truth is this game is a complicated game 
And this game is the very embodiment of the concept of instead of looking for perfection, you just look for things that will get the job done. So when I started looking at it in those terms, I became a lot more confident in my ability to get the job done, giving up on the pipe dream of coming up with quote-unquote optimal builds. And so what this build will give you, even if you're not able to follow it to the letter, it'll give you a good platform with which you can get most of what you need done in this game because it gives you a bit of defense, it gives you offense, it gives you scalability, it has all three ways of doing damage to enemies, you know, spells, attacks, indirect damage, and it's just, it's just fun to play. It has some quality of life features as well, like, you know, singleton, like shutting down enemy resurrections, and it works for me. However, like I said, it's by no means optimized. You can take a build like this and go in a completely different direction and maybe you'll wind up with something even better than what I have and maybe when you you know hit upon that improved you know supercharged build you'll be making your own build guide that'll be even better than this and then and then I'll be linking to that I'll be like don't don't follow this this is garbage follow that other guy instead you know I'll have to put in like an update in the video description it could happen. All of this is to say that this game rewards you for finding your own way to play. By taking the resources you have and then figuring out, okay, what is the way that I can use these things to get the job done? And that is the goal. Not finding some hypothetical perfect build. No, the goal is to get the job done, whether the job is to fight nether bosses, uh, whether the job is to fight false gods, whether the job is to uh, uh, go on instability 5 and like comfortably clear realms on instability 5, whether the job is to go really deep, you know, into the, you know, realm death thousand plus. You take what you have and you build something that gives you what you need to get those things done. And this build, I am confident, can get those things done. But, like I said, I'm sure there are all kinds of ways you can improve, tweak, and optimize it. And that really is in your hands. I have uh, done my part. The rest is... Uh, it, it, it's on you. And with that, I think it's time to end this episode. Before we end, let's just take a walk through our base. Once again, let's admire this uh, thing that we put together um, in the previous episode, commemorating the fact that we've beaten all of the gods at the gate of the, at the gate of the gods. And let's walk through our uh, guild hall as well. God, this looks so awesome. <sighs> but yeah, with that, I think it is time to draw things to a close. Next episode, I think I'm going to do one normal episode. And then the episode after that is when I'll do the 100 realms with the, uh, um, with the pariah to get those final achievements. But next episode, I, I just want to do one more normal episode before I start doing, you know, weird, long, grindy things. But yeah, that's going to be the plan. A regular, normal, you know, just a chill episode next time. That's, uh, that's, that's what we got going on. But yeah, that's going to be all for this one. Hope you had a good time. Hope you'll join me in the next episode as well. And uh, until then, take care.